Good morning. Welcome to Redeemer Women's Bible Study. It is Tuesday morning. It's a beautiful morning. If you are watching online or listening via podcast, we welcome you into this space with us as well. Um, yeah, let's pray and we can, we'll just, we'll get started. Dearly Father, I thank you so much for this day. I thank you for the sun that rose to shine upon us. I thank you for the promises of spring that we see blooming on trees and coming up from the ground. Thank you for your promises, Lord, that that you've given us for your son. Lord, I pray that this morning that we might see you more fully, that we might know you. I pray that in our study of your word, that we will be found by you even as we seek you. Meet us where we are, Lord. I pray that all outside distractions would flee, that you would guard this space that we're in today, but also around my friends who are watching or listening later on. Just bless them, Father, in their study. Lord, I pray that I might disappear, that you might be made great, that these words would be yours. Lord, we lift up all those in peril today, all those in harm's way, both in our city, in our state, in our country, but also abroad. Lord, we lift up the Ukraine to you and all of the battle and the fighting. We pray for the families there, for the children. Lord, help us to see your goodness today. Show us more of yourself. Thank you for your word that when it is spoken, it does not come back to you void. Thank you that it is living and active and sharper than a double-edged sword. Let us know you more, Father. Amen. Um, we have been showing the kids, you know, there's lots, there's so much on the news these days. And so they've seen parts of the footage from the Ukraine and just having thoughtful conversations about the world with them. And Henry has really taken on the term bad guys and uh, we will be walking around like in the Costco parking lot. Anybody that has the vests on for like, you know, the guys who bring the carts in at Costco have the yellow vests or the crossing guard at school where Evie goes to school. Anybody or the guy cleaning the windows at the library. Anyone with a vest on, he's like, mommy, bad guys. I'm like, no, baby, this is not a bad guy. Um, but there's just so much going on in the world. And I think even it's hard for kids to grapple with it, but then it's also, I think, hard for us to think about those things, right? Because we're sitting here in this beautiful space and it's a beautiful day outside. And even if it was raining, um, it would be beautiful because it, there's, there's not bombs dropping. And, but there are parts of, there's people in the world who their day is not like this. Right? And so here as we sit and study the Word of God, how do we hold those two truths, like those two realities in our hands? And so my hope is, is that this morning that we would see God's goodness and we would see His provision and that we would realize the kingdom around us a little bit more. Um, I think every chapter I fall a little bit more in love with the Gospel of Mark and how he writes. Um, he's an incredible writer in each chapter. I think in the past, because it is a shorter, more condensed gospel, I have been able to just gloss through it. But there's so much truth, and he's truly trying to tell us something. You know, we've talked all semester that he is saying Jesus is the Christ, and this is the, his gospel, his truth. So, um, another yesterday or over the weekend, um, over the weekend, we were out for this walk. It was on that 75 degree day on Sunday afternoon. And there's this certain turn in our neighborhood and this big you know, intersection and with these big yards. And the sun was shining in such a way that you could see, and this is the first time I've seen it, swarms of bugs, right? Swarms of bugs, maybe mosquitoes, who knows? And the kids are just like, ah, there's bugs. And, and I said the comment, I made the comment, oh, that, that means that spring is coming, that summer's almost here. 
And Charlie's response, my five-year-old's response to that, right? Evie's freaking out. He, he's like, oh, that's so great, mommy. And it was this childlike excitement that bugs meant summer, right? And this is that childlike faith that we were talking about earlier in, in this lesson, earlier in this gospel. And so this morning, may we have that childlike excitement for the truth of the gospel. Because this chapter and the next couple chapters, they're not always easy to take in, right? It's getting more tense. There's more opposition, right? But may we have this childlike excitement for what these words hold. Okay, so at the end of chapter 11, we see Jesus' authority questioned, right? We see Jesus' authority questioned. And so in chapter 12, his, his authority is questioned at the end of chapter 11, and then chapter 12 is a, is a continuation of that. And so we're going to see in, in chapter 12, really from 1127, um, where his authority is questioned all the way through the end of chapter 12 to 1237, we're going to see five conflict situations. There'll be five conflict situations within this chapter, and we're going to see how Jesus answers those conflicts. And they are in short, and we'll go back over as we get to each one, there we're going to see the tenants, the parable of the tenants, there's the question of tribute and taxes. A question about the resurrection. The great commandment, what's the greatest commandment? And then this question about David's son. So there's, we're going to work, work our way through five conflicts. So this is, this is Jesus' his immediate response to the Sanhedrin challenging him in chapter 11 is this parable of the tenants. So it begins in chapter, one, ch chapter 12, verse 1. And he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and put a, fan a fence around it and dug a pit for the wine press and built a tower and, le and leased it to tenants and went away to another country. Now what should be said here is that the, in, within the study of rab rabbinic parables and then also the ancient texts, that this situation for this parable actually happened. Like there, were, there was actually land, the area around Galilee and Jerusalem, they were large land estates. Not everyone was a landowner. And so there, was off, there were often people who owned land, leased it to others to farm, and they would go somewhere else. So this is not an unheard of story. Remember when he taught in parables, he was teaching in ways that they would actually be able to look up and visualize so this, this parable is not so far from the actual reality around them because the land, this, the great land estate, were, were often farmed by these tenants and the owners were absent. Verse 2, when the season came, he sent a servant to the tenants to get from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Again, he sent them another servant, and they struck him on the head and treated him shamefully. And he sent another, so the owner sends another, and him they killed. And so many others, and some, some they beat and some they killed. And he, still, and he, had, he had still one other, a beloved son. Finally, he sent to them saying, they will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. And they took him and killed him and threw him out of the out of the vineyard. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. So Jesus' response to his authority being challenged by the Sanhedrin was this parable. He spoke in several parables, but this is the one that Mark records. Notice that in verse 1. He began to teach them in parables, but this is the parable that Mark recorded. He's drawing, Jesus, Jesus is drawing with, his, with this imagery, talking about a vineyard. He's drawing, drawing from the imagery of the vineyard in Isaiah 5.1. In Isaiah 5.1, it says, Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. 
He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it and he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And the wild grapes weren't able to be used, right? And so he is drawing straight from Isaiah with this imagery. And the reality is, is that it's not just allegory, but it is a judgment parable. And in fact, a judgment parable invites judgment from the readers or from the hearers and the readers. So we should be thinking about who was in the wrong here. Jesus used this parable to expose the plan, the attempt, the attempt to take his life and God's judgment on the planners. So this is when we begin to really see that Jesus fully understood what was going to happen to him. He fully understood not only what was going to happen to him, but also all of God's story. All of God's story. And and in truth, in inheritance law at the time, this also was not so far from the truth, that if the landowner died, right? So if the landowner died and did not have an heir, that whoever was living on the land was able to claim it. And so the, the, the land, the tenants of this, they thought, oh, let's kill the heir so that this land might be ours. Legally, within their culture, that would have been allowed. But what will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Ha, verse 10, have you not read this scripture? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. What, Je- what Jesus is doing here, he's quoting Psalm 118, 22. And when he's talking about the many others, the, in verse 5, he sent another and another and another, and they were beaten and killed. These are the Old Testament prophets. And ultimately, the rejection of John and the rejection of Jesus is ultimately the rejection of God. So the, the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin's response in verse 12, they were seeking to arrest him, but feared the people. And this is smart, for they perceived that he had told the parable against them. You don't say. So they left him and went away. Now in this wording in verse 12, it's very similar to in chapter 11, 18. It's very similar. This might be the end of the third day. Remember back in in chapter 11, there was the three days. There was the three-day trips into Jerusalem, but the third day never ended. This wording here was very very similar to the ending of the other two days. And so there's the thought that this might be the end of the third day, but that's just fun literary possibility with the way that Mark is writing here. So we we see this parable, and Jesus is saying, I am the heir. You have rejected everybody else. You've rejected everyone else, and you're going to reject me. But ultimately, rejecting the heir is rejecting the landowner. And then drawing back from Isaiah 5.1, Israel was the vine, right? And all throughout the Old Testament, we see Israel as the vine that does not produce fruit, just as Israel is the bride who is not faithful. He is reminding them of everything that they've been told. And in truth, in truth, in the beginning of the gospel, in Mark 1, 15, John is saying, behold, the kingdom of God is at hand. And we are seeing the kingdom of God at hand. They are in conversation with him. And he is saying, you're going to reject me. Ultimately, you're going to kill me. And so they want to arrest him, but they're afraid of the people. And so then, in in verse 13, we move to the next conflict. So they keep trying to catch him. And they say, and they they sent to him some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians. Remember in chapter 3, that was the first time that we saw the Pharisees and the Herodians colluding together. Normally, they never talked. They weren't on the same side, but they both couldn't stand Jesus. And so he brought them together. So the Sanhedrin, they sent the Pharisees and Herodians to trap him in his talk, right? They're trying to catch him. 
And they came and they said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and do not care about anyone's opinion, which is also very intuitive, for you are not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not? Now that's, that's a very bold question. Even in today's society, right? If someone were to ask a leader, should we pay taxes, depending on where it was, they could answer the wrong way and could get in a lot of trouble, right? But Jesus, in verse 15, knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, why do you put me to the test? Kind of like, and, and the language there in the original language, he's kind of exasperated. Why are you still testing me? Because see, they're trying to catch him theologically and politically. He could answer it both ways in a way that they could catch him. Theologically, the Pharisees could come after him, and politically, the Herodians could. They were hoping to catch him in both ways. Because you see, back then, there were three main groups. There were three main groups who, who got the most attention because they probably spoke up the much, spoke up the most. There were the Zealots, the Pharisees, and the Herodians. Okay, the Zealots absolutely did not think that they should pay taxes. They were zealous for God, right? The Pharisees, because they wanted to go the middle line, they followed the law of God, but then they also paid taxes because they didn't want to get in trouble because they cared a lot about what other people thought. And then the Herodians were sold out to Rome, so of course they paid taxes, right? So there are three big groups that could have had issues with how he answered. And so Jesus says, bring me a denarius, right? It's a silver coin. Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And they brought one and he said to them, whose likeness and inscription is on this? Right? He answers questions with questions. And it's an obvious answer. And they said to him, Caesar's. So Caesar's face was on the coin. And Jesus says to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. So he answered it both ways. Give to Caesar what's Caesar's, right? They were supposed to pay taxes. Now, whether or not the tax collectors were stealing from them, that was a whole other story. But give to Caesar what was Caesar's, but that line, and give to God the things that are God's. So on the coin was Caesar's image, right? And it went out all over the Roman Empire. That was the main way that they were able to pay, and that's how they were supposed to pay taxes. And, and kings and emperors send their images out to claim their kingdom. Now, who, who bears the God's image? Are we not image bearers of God? Jesus was taking them straight back to Genesis straight back to Adam and Eve, who were made in God's image. And truly, God is king. And what do kings do? They send their images, their image out throughout the world, throughout their kingdom, to say, this is mine, but then also to say, this is the type of king I am. So in this statement, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, but render to God the things that are God, and that is you, your life. Are you rendering your life to him? And they marveled at him. Marveled. And we're going to begin to see in this chapter that he keeps coming back to God. He keeps coming back to how we live before him. And so moving on to the next conflict with, this, with the resurrection. In verse 18, the Sadducees came to see him who say there's no resurrection and they asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife who leaves no child, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. This is true. There were seven brothers. This is where they try and catch him. There were seven brothers. The first, wife, the first took a wife, and when he died, left no offspring. The second took her and died, leaving no offspring. The third likewise. And the, seven left no, and the seven left no offspring. Last of all, the woman also died. It's a lot of people. In the resurrection, when they rise again, whose wife will she be? For seven had her as a wife. 
And Jesus said to them, is this not the reason you're wrong? Because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. So see, it's funny that the Sadducees are asking about the resurrection because they actually don't believe in the resurrection of the dead. So they don't even believe that this is going to happen. And they're asking about it. And Jesus' response... Jesus' response to them is that you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. Verse 25, for when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. Meaning they live as angels in heaven in God's full, in full communion with God, where he is. And as for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses in the passage about the bush? How God spoke to him from the bush saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not God of the dead, but the God of the living. You are quite wrong. So here he's quoting, Jesus is quoting Exodus 3, 6. And this is in the, in the desert when Moses sees the burning bush and he asks who, who is talking to him. And he says, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Jacob. Jesus, using, quoting from this passage, using these words, he is reminding them of God's fidelity to his own covenant. It is because of the faithfulness of God that he will resurrect the dead. Because truly, when, Mo- when he was talking to Moses, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had physically died. But in the language, he is still actively their God. So in his response to the Sadducees, he's pointing, he's showing them that they have failed to understand Scripture and the fullness of the power of God. They were only thinking of concrete, the the concrete use of earthly marriage. They were only thinking of the physical things that we can see on this side of heaven. They weren't thinking about the reality of what the covenant promises us, right? It doesn't take us long to realize that physical death happens to everyone, right? But God's promising eternal life. And he spoke life all throughout the Old Testament. All of the the covenants are God saying that you will be my people and I will be your God. That we will live in communion together. We will dwell together. And so here we are now and towards the end of this Mark's gospel and truly the man with whom God's fullness was pleased to dwell is speaking these words to him. He is reminding them of the absolute power of God. They would missed it. They've missed the forest for the trees, all of them, for different reasons. And so the question for us is, do we get lost in the tiny details? Do we get lost in the mundane? Do we get lost in the now and not yet? I dare say that I do. We are living in this tension that the kingdom has come and is coming. But this season that we're in feels like one long Good Friday. Where is Easter? But remember, we are Easter people. We are resurrection people. And truly, we're going to see as this this moves forward that All of this, all of it, was for for you and for me. Jesus was making the way. He had to come, right? He had to come. He had to be rejected by the tenants. And what we see in that tenant parable is that he's going to destroy the former tenants and give the vineyard to others. He is speaking about the new Israel, He's not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. And it's through Jesus that we, the church, become the new Israel. And so people are still 
questioning and still in conflict with him. And so one of the scribes comes up, and at some point, I would just wanted to sit back and quit asking questions, but, you know, we weren't there. And I dare say that in my own life, I, I keep asking, beating a dead horse often, even though I love horses. Verse 28, one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another and seeing what he answered them well. So he, he saw that, that Jesus was answering all of these questions well. And the scribe says, which commandment is the most important of all? Once again, trying to catch him. And Jesus answered, the most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So he answers, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. But that, that question of which commandment is the greatest gives this idea, and this is speaking to the pharisaical life, of, of how we are saved by our actions, by our self-righteousness. Are, there's, are there greater or lesser commandments along, along the lines of are there greater or lesser sins? It's all a measuring act on how good or bad we might be. But Jesus answers them, no, there's, there's no greater commandments than these. Love God and love your neighbor. And the scribe said to, him, said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is the one and there's no other beside him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and all the strength and to what love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all, of, all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. So this man understands. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Jesus is saying that what John said, what we've already, already, already talked about in chapter one, the kingdom of God is at hand. And Jesus says, you are not far from that. And it says, after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. And the reality is, is that they kept missing the point of the law. The law was to call us to rea realize our need of God. It wasn't to make it so that we didn't need him, but it was to point to the fact that we needed him so desperately. But then the law also showed us to how much we were supposed to love others. And we've talked about this in short, but the first five commandments are about how to love God, and the, and the last five are about how to love your neighbor. All of it, the Ten Commandments, is about loving God and our neighbor. So he combined all of them in this answer. But nobody dared, nobody dared to ask him any more questions. So then Jesus starts talking, and he says, as Jesus taught in the temple, he said, how can the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? David himself and the Holy Spirit declared, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put my enemies under your feet. So this is David speaking, The Lord said to my Lord. And Jesus says, David himself calls him Lord. How is he his son? And the great throng heard him gladly. This is speaking to this, when using this Davidic language, it, there is this deep longing for a restored kingdom. Ever since David, they talked about the coming son of David, great David's greater son. And so they were, they were longing for the restoration of what Israel used to be, forgetting the fact that in all of the writing, in all of the language, it was even speaking to something greater than what it used to be. Instead of looking back, they should have been looking forward expectantly but here Jesus is saying the Messiah is not only the son of David, but he is also his Lord, right? He is fully man, but he is also fully God. And that is the beauty and the mystery of who Jesus is. And in his teaching, he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like greetings in the marketplaces and have the best seats in the synagogues. 
In the places of honor at feasts, who devour widows' houses for a pittance, make long and for a pittance, and they make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. Now, this verses thirty-eight through forty. This is the end of Jesus's public ministry. From the, going forward, when he is speaking, he's speaking privately or mostly just to his disciples. But isn't that poignant that his last public words are beware of the scribes, beware of those who are self-righteous, who use the law for themselves, and who devour those who they should be taking care of. And so then, just as, as Jesus does, he sits down opposite the treasury and watch the people putting money in the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums, which is a beautiful thing. But then a poor woman came and she put in two copper coins, which makes a penny. And he called his disciples to him, just the disciples, and he said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she has, all that she had to live on. He is, he is contrasting the self-righteous scribes that he just warned us about with the devout faith of a poor widow. What's beautiful here is that she put in two copper coins. She could have only put in one, but she put in two. She literally, she put in all that she had. Rather than giving out of her abundance, she gave what she had. And so our question for us today, and I think throughout this whole chapter, it's to really think about where, where, what do you need to hear from him? What good word do you need to hear? But then also, what are you white-knuckling? What are you holding on so, so tightly to? Right? What is it that is hindering you from having that childlike faith, that trust of a two-year-old jumping off of something way too high, never doubting that mom or dad will catch him? Where's that? What's hindering that? And I would say that like the Pharisees and the scribes and often the disciples, that it is because we have such a narrow view of his word and we don't realize how powerful he truly is. Because the reality is, is that every aspect of your life and my life in the Ukraine, in the U.S., in Winston-Salem, in my hometown of Orlando, everywhere it's in his power, under his power and in his hand. There is not a person in power that God does not know about that he did not put there. We're told that all throughout scripture, kingdoms rise and they fall by his will and plan. And what we have to do is look at all of scripture from Genesis to Revelation and recognize the power and the greatness of God. The same God who wove lives together from David all the way to Jesus so that he was genetically his son, but also fully God. Scripture is mind-blowing what God can do, right? And we're going to see Jesus is about to foretell in chapter 13, hold on, the destruction of the temple. And guess what? It happens 70 years later. It's horrible. But God was in it and through it and with it, right? And so in these times, and and as you read this scripture, ask him to broaden your view of it and to give us this healthy understanding of just how big and powerful and most assuredly good he is. He is our good, good father, right? And he sent his son to the vineyard to be killed, his beloved son to be killed, in order that all nations could come to him. And that includes us. Let me pray. 
Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your goodness. Lord, I pray that you would bless these women in their study of your word, that their minds would be blown by the words that you give us. Help us to make connections and draw right conclusions. Lord, impart your wisdom. Help us to help us in our unbelief, Lord. Be with them and they're going out and they're coming in. Bless those who are at home listening. And Lord, we just pray that you bring us all back again next week. Amen. Thank you, ladies. <laughs>